You know, now that I think about it, I don't think I've ever been in your house before. You got like a shit ton of magic cards. Really? The Of all of the things I have in my house, that surprises you? Eh, surprise probably isn't the right word. I've got to be honest, though. I don't remember ever living here. But, well, this is clearly my stuff. My shitty car door deck, replica title belts, the Orb of Chaos, my Bacall Tribe buff. Uh-huh. Look, whatever. I'll come by in a little while and check on you because I have no clue what you're talking about anymore. Oh, it's just like a thing from Survivor. I'm about like 90% sure that's not what he's talking about. Oh, great. Cena's back. You done making Fast and Furious movies yet? Psh, you wish. Was well, that about the Fast and Furious comment or just about you being John Cena? Yes. Okay, what in the bluebell tit are you doing here? Aren't you busy being some kind of god devil thing? Okay, Boone, homie, I gotta ask. These, these things fucking laced with something or some shit. Oh yeah, right. Uh, funny fireman, you should leave. I'll take care of him. Don't worry about it. We're bros, and I need to have a private conversation. You do? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I even have survivor material for you. I have been waiting 10,000 years for this day. Yeah, Jacob, we're good, man. Trust me, this one's really important. Okay. You know what? Both of y'all moving with. Boone, just send me a text when you're done or some shit, okay? I'm out of here. Yeah, so here's the deal. Something with the reset clearly fucked up if you don't remember living here, because you definitely should. Wait, so am I, like, not covering Survivor material? Oh, no, I absolutely have that. I figure if I'm gonna have to fix this, I may as well give you something good out of it. There you go. Oh. Oh, shit. Okay, well, ladies and or gentlemen, allow me to introduce... Russell Hans, one of the most infamous Survivor players in the history of the entire game. He's played four times, two back-to-back -back seasons where he made the final Tribal Council, and two seasons where he was the second person voted out. Now, I'm not going to say too much about my opinion on him as a player here, because, believe it or not, that entire conversation is incredibly relevant to this video as a general subject matter. But some of the things he's known for are being the first person to find a hidden immunity idol with no clues and basically being an arrogant jerk and that's not me saying that he'll admit that pissing people off is part of his game plan because it in theory makes it harder for the people he's up against to operate rationally the things that russell is most well known for in survivor primarily entails strategic maneuvering so it would make sense that he might have a leg up or two on topic of overrated survivor players, at least from the perspective of strategy, and not fall into some of the same pratfalls as a lot of other people who make lists like this. Well, uh, the thing is, not only does he wind up falling into some of the same problems, but we'll see some problems unique to this list as well, given the context of who's making it. One more piece of admin before we get started, though. This video was made in August of 2019, and Russell will refer to Season 40, Winners at War, filming as he's making the video. When it actually wrapped a full month before this video came out, but that's not really something worth getting onto him about, because he wouldn't really know the exact date that Winners of War ended filming, what with not being a winner and all. As such, all the information I'm going to be using is from Season 39 and prior with certain exceptions that will be explained when they are relevant. With that out of the way, let's get started. So I'm sitting here on vacation in Florida, Panama City, and I want to start doing more Survivor rants and uh, top fives and top tens. I most recently did a top ten of the uh, top ten Survivors that will never play Survivor again. I thought that was pretty interesting. Now, for those of you new to my channel, you may know that I normally play a little bit of their introduction, and that's the point where I tend to start talking about things like production and mic quality, because these are the first impressions that can help give a direction for what the channel may need to improve on the most. And, well, obviously, that's what we're seeing here with the mic quality especially. I will point out that I took a look at one or two of his most recent videos, and this is something he has improved over time. 
However, the overall presentation is still this straight at the camera rambly style that's been out of date since like 2016. Like, I get the podcast to present like that, but you typically have multiple people bouncing off of each other when you're doing a podcast. And if part of your brand is to refer to yourself as one of the greatest survivor players of all time, then maybe a little more pizzazz would help. Background music, a little bit more B-roll, something like that. But hey, if you don't care about it that much, you don't. It's really not that big of a deal at the end of the day. I just felt the need to point it out. Uh, now I want to do a top five on the top five overrated survivors. Now, you may notice I've dyed my beard. Uh, I like to keep it spicy every once in a while, you know, I still go out, I want to look younger, uh, so if you think that that's weird, uh, you know, uh, what? Okay, y you know what I think is weird? Just all of the things about that. Like, just, this is the topic, my beard is spicy! It, it, it's spicy to dye your beard when it's gray? That's what spicy means to you? Dude, I bought mayonnaise with more spice than I dyed my beard. You know what would be spicy? It's if you dyed it purple or green or some shit. And you like fade out from that comment too? You know, like you know that the whole ramble is the dumbest thing you've ever heard in your life. And you still just leave it in anyway. Fucking cool i guess the rules of survivor state that if someone plays a spice unity idol then any beard died against that person will not count and the person with the next highest number of beards will be weird this is an idol any beard died against russell will not count you're such a gamer now i got two people on this list that's considered legends but i'm gonna explain to you why uh they're overrated both of them only got to their status by one thing that they've done. And to me, uh, because of how big they became, it's overrated. Now, most of these people, uh, with the exception of one, is uh, people that, that are well known. And you'll understand uh, which ones I'm talking about not, and when I get to the one that's not that well known. But, but uh, he's, he, he won his last season. Yeah, about that. The only reason I know who the not well-known guy is supposed to be is because of the fact that you said he won his season right here. Yeah, we'll get to him later, but um, let's just say the reason I didn't pick up on that is because he is well-known. And for reasons that are very relevant to you putting him on this list. All right, number five. Now this one's gonna get me a little slack, I'm sure. I just did a podcast with him. And uh, some people probably agree with me. Most probably won't. He is a legend, and his name is Johnny Fairplay. All right, so we're already kind of starting to fall into some traps here. Not explicitly yet, but there's the implication of doing so. If most people think a player is overrated, they are by definition not overrated. I'm going to break down why this is later on. So for now, let's focus on another aspect of that. You did a podcast with him, therefore you're going to catch grief for including him on this list. There's really no causal link to make that happen. And to be fair, this could very well just be your way of saying, hey, overrated doesn't mean bad. You still call him a legend, but th actually, let's talk about that for a second. So being a legend and being overrated aren't connected either, at least not in the way that it sounds like you're using it. Based on what you say throughout the video, I'm inclined to believe the metric you're using is that people are overrated in terms of gameplay. I mean, if you were doing it in terms of how memorable a character is, then boy does nothing about this list make any sense whatsoever. So I'm going to operate under the assumption that the thing that's overrated about them is their gameplay. Problem is that you can be a legend for reasons other than your gameplay, as we'll point out with this entry in particular. Now, the reason I say Johnny Fairplay, because he was so big at one point when he uh, got off the season, it was crazy. He did other shows, he did all kind of events. He, I'm sure he had uh, lots of fun. But Johnny did one thing. He's one of the players that did one thing that made him who he was. Now, take away his grandmother dying scene. Take that away. Then who is he now? 
I mean, he still had the entire wrestling heel persona. You say it was one moment, but there's a lot of reasons why he had all of these big media appearances. So first of all, kind of feels like I say this in every video I make, context. Players from the first few seasons of Survivor are generally going to get more media attention than people who played later. Part of that is because Survivor's the kind of show where you go look through the back catalog and binge its history if you're new to it. You know, like One Piece with more nudity and slightly more gaze. Anyway, the more relevant reason to him doing all the media is that Survivor was more mainstream in the early 2000s. So anybody who actually wanted celebrity status from a reality contestant role was much more likely to get it. There's also the fact that this season was pirate themed and aired a few months after the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie. You know, when everyone was into pirates. It's like if instead of Survivor Africa, they did Survivor Fairy Tale Swamp. It was right after Shrek. Of course, people would be more interested. Now, they haven't done Fairy Tale Swamp Survivor yet, but give it time. I'm sure they will. But of course, then there's the part that debunks the last bit of that. You've got him being drunk at Tribal, the several arguments he had with other players, the wrestler impersonations. Remember when I talked about the wrestling heel persona? Now, were these gameplay? No, not really. And if they were, they were actually kind of weak gameplay. But let's take away his dead grandmother moment when looking at the narrative on the island, which is easier than you think it is because the other players did not know it was fake. He was intentionally playing the villain in order to garner whatever advantage he could out of it, made the final three in spite of Sandra Diaz Twine wanting him gone the entire game. Does any of this remind you of anyone Russell Hance, third place contestant of Survivor Heroes vs. Villains? If anything, this makes him better than you in terms of accomplishment. You had a final three. If he had been in a season with a final three, He'd be sitting in front of a jury, and I feel he's more likely to get jury votes away from Sandra than Lil is. On top of that, he never won immunity, which you did in both of your seasons. And hidden immunity idols didn't exist yet, so he couldn't fall back on finding those either. He did the same thing you did against the same player you did, but with zero safety. So... You know, if you're saying that he's overrated when the thing he's known for isn't even gameplay, then what are you saying about yourself, Mr. Greatest of all time? He doesn't even play again, right? No, he doesn't. Okay, cool. So the main reason that Jeff Probst hates the guy doesn't exist then. Yeah, so fun fact, he actually did play again in Micronesia Fans vs. Favorites, where he famously came out in Jeff Probst cosplay at the beginning of that season and took a header into a fucking boat at or after, depending on how you view the timing, the first challenge. You know, right after he got his teeth knocked out in an award ceremony by Danny Bonaducci, he basically quit the game at the first tribal council. And some would argue whether it was because of his wife being seven months pregnant or if it was because of the head injury. There's questionable reports about how honest each of those answers are. But the point here is that Probst really doesn't like fair play which is the reason he wasn't on your second season on your tribe. He also continues to be cast for stuff, including in wrestling, mind you, in 2023, whereas you had to go to Australia for you to fail at playing the exact same game plan for the fourth time in a row. So he did one thing that made him a legend. Now, it was one of the greatest, maybe, arguably, the greatest move in uh, survivor history. I think it's one of the greatest. If you ask me, I'll say it is one of the greatest. But, uh, you, you know, that one move doesn't make him a, a great player. See, that last part of your statement there displays the biggest flaw in your logic. Fair play isn't a legend because he's a great player. He's a legend because he's a great character that happens to be a pretty decent player. And bear in mind, there's strategic moves he was making that were very good, and the dead grandmother moment was, in part, a strategic maneuver used on the island, a lie he told in order to garner sympathy. Now, I could harp on the fact that the one person who didn't believe him on the island was the person that beat both him and you in that game, 
but I'll have plenty of opportunities to dunk on you for that later. For now, let's focus on one of Fairplay's strategic moves. So let's talk about the thing you threatened to sue Zapatera over, throwing tribal immunity. So while they were three up, Burton from the Drake tribe on Pearl Islands pitched throwing immunity, and they did. They threw the challenge. Then instead of the target they wanted to vote out, they voted out Burton. You know who orchestrated that blindside on Burton? Johnny fucking Fairplay. Funny how he could navigate a tribe throwing a challenge better than you did. Anyway, on top of that, Burton returns to the game and becomes an ally for Fairplay, which serves to also kind of make him a shield to get voted out before him when the women decide to work together against the two of them, mostly because of Fairplay and Burton blindsiding Rupert, which was a move that literally defined the shape of the endgame that Fairplay enacted. But that's not even the big thing I want to bring up here. As big as the two biggest blindsides in the entire fucking season are. So, later on, Johnny would get to go to the Morgan Beach and take something because of a challenge reward. He would, as a means to diminish the other tribe's morale, reveal that the only challenge they won all season to that point was the one that the Drake tribe threw. And you know what happened? The effort to hurt their morale backfired, and they went into the merge dead even on numbers. You know, like Foa Foa, who lost all but two tribal immunities, but still ended up making up almost all of the endgame regardless. Yeah, the more you talk, the more I start to realize that there's so much you have in common with a guy that you're calling overrated, that it looks a lot like a self-report. Like... Uh, they think, no, he's going to have an opportunity to show what he has, I think, pretty soon, I think. I don't know for sure, but I think they'll do a Legends, and then he'll have an opportunity to show people what he really has besides a gimmick. The Russell making incorrect predictions counter is currently at 0 0.5. Don't keep track of that, I'm not fucking doing it. Because you're half right. He wouldn't play after Micronesia. You know because Jeff Probst blacklisted him, like you. And if they were to do a legend season, Jeff Probst would still refuse to cast him, especially since he has a lot more behind the scenes power than he did during season 16, or season 20 for that matter. That being said, he is getting to show what he can do in a competitive show again by way of House of Villains, where as of writing this script, we know for certain that he's in the top six out of 10, which is, still better than your last two survivor appearances even if we factor in the fact that there are only 10 contestants although he has yet to win super villain of the week competition but that's not what fair play is good at anyway so that's really no surprise so i do give you half credit somebody still wanted to cast him even if that somebody wasn't jeff probst and that's what it was it was a gimmick move a wonderful great move I wish i would have thought about it oh it was wonderful fantastic one of the best things you've seen in your whole life but it was nothing more than a gimmick. Pick a fucking lane, Hurricane Katrina, man. But, you know, uh, and if you ask, do you know Johnny Fairplay? People are like, oh, I'm, I don't know. Oh, the one that said the dead grandma thing. Oh, okay. <coughs> I know him. Yeah, I know him. Hey, remember when you said there was one player who was obscure in your eyes in this list? Yeah, this isn't the one you were talking about. And yet, apparently, he is. For that matter, though, if I feel like you're just getting into repetition at this point. This kind of shows you not knowing what you're talking about, especially since you just did a podcast with this guy, according to you, and still can't talk about anything else he's done. Or, I don't know, maybe shill the podcast a little bit more than just mentioning that you did one? Look, I'm sorry, but... If I can pause an interjection in the middle of it in order to promote World Weaver's Web, a D&D one-shot that's going to be on Spiffy Needle Geeks that I'm going to be in on December 30th, then a self-centered asshole like you should be able to shill yourself a lot better than this. So that's what they know him from. If you take Russell Hans and you put Russell Hans back in the day when Johnny played, I would be so damn popular, I'd be president of the United States. <sighs> no, you wouldn't. I mean, we're going to set aside the wannabe Donald Trumpism of that. First of all, making the entry about yourself counter is at one out of five. 
but this is where all the comparisons between you and fair play become a lot more relevant remember when i said that fair play did what he did with no safety and without idols and how it was the same as what you did in samoa and heroes versus villains yeah, I think we all know how quick you get voted out when you don't have idols to follow the cameraman in order to find. Even if you're taking the place of fair play in that season at the very end, I'll actually be much more honest than you and say there's a possibility you actually can make the final two because you seem like you might last in the final competition a little bit better than fair play does. But the question is whether or not you would make the moves and keep your threat level low enough to get there in the first place or if you would wind up making your threat too well known, like Burton did. So, uh, you know, he, he was one of the first to ever really play back in the day when they didn't play at all. So I say number five, sorry, Johnny, but I got to say it, Johnny Fairplay. Okay. My man, this is a lie. For one, I know for a fact that you've heard of Richard Hatch. He was the first one to come up with voting together as a strategy and through the final immunity specifically to protect jury votes. And a lot of people view Tina Wesson as this sweet old lady winner back in the day during season two, but she was maneuvering and doing some fairly cutthroat things that would be left kind of under the radar. Ethan Zahn was the actual first player to pitch throwing tribal immunity after a tribe swap, a mechanic that you have never played through in your survivor career. Not only was Boston Rob implementing a lot of the same strategies from when he whipped your ass all the way back in Marquesas and All Stars, the latter of which is the season after this one, but the winner of that season was one of the first to consistently play from the bottom and, unlike you, didn't look like an asshole doing it. The last two examples from before Pearl Islands really bite your point in the ass, though. Thailand was won by infamously one of the most hated winners in the form of Bryden Heideck, who was known for his flat out villainous gameplay and viewing everyone around him as expendable pawns. So does that remind you of anyone Russell Hance of the villains tribe? There's a notable example from the Amazon as well, although not so much the winner. That person is Rob Sesternino, considered by many to be the father of modern survivor strategy for reasons that I'll unfortunately have to get into later in the video. Number four, Chris Underwood. You know, I'm like 90% sure there are some survivor fans who watch the show that also watch my content and they'll already know what the problem is with Chris Underwood being here. Like, before I even started talking, they probably paused the video because they needed to scream at him for being on an overrated list. You know that trap I talked about earlier? How if the majority of people think someone is overrated, then they are by definition not overrated? Not to spoil it too much, but there's a big reason why Chris falls in that particular category. So I'm going to go ahead and break that down here. For you to think that someone or something is overrated, that means you think that they are rated more highly than they should be. Now, there's qualifiers you could put on that to make it more narrow, but the way the term is used tends to mean it in a more general sense. For example, in your entry on Johnny Fairplay, the theory behind what you were saying makes sense. He's not some god-tier game master. He's no Mike Tyson. And that's not to say that he's Brett, but what he is, is a decent player that's a great character. And, well, you have a tendency to look at things more so from the perspective of game than the perspective of story or personality. So he doesn't rate as highly for you. But when you say his name, I get why he would be on the list. Chris is someone that no one likes. That people generally think doesn't deserve the spot he's got, and I'll get into more detail about that, but this is a case where you're saying that someone who people call bad is overrated. That's not how that term works. Now, it is possible that you could think that he's worse than the general consensus, but that feels like you're grasping at straws quite a bit to put that person on top five most overrated, especially since 
You know, it just sounds like you think most people think he's good when I watch back what you actually said in this video. But I think I should let you explain why he's here. Now, I think that uh, the only reason I put him in here is because it's recent and the most controversy of, of a winner in the history of the game. The most controversy in the history for a winner of the game. That sounds like someone that a lot of people don't think deserve to win, Russ. Like you, for example, but I digress. You see why this doesn't belong on an overrated list yet? Uh, people ask me all the time, what's the hardest thing about Survivor? It's not the food, to me, it's not the elements, it's not not eating, it is the mental aspect of the game. Now, when you can go the whole game, damn near, and then you come back in the game and never had to play, and you win, that's a slap in the face to the ones that really play that game. And the majority of people would agree with you on that front. He tends to make a lot of lists of worst survivor winners because of the fact that he was voted out third, came back at final five, and played three rounds to win the whole damn thing. The controversy comes from how hard he played when he did come back in the game. And I'd argue that playing that hard is what got him voted out in the first place. But the fact that remains that there were two people in the finale that people wanted to win over Chris. Rick Devins, who ironically enough also came back in the game after being voted out at an earlier point, and Gavin, who kind of fucked up his final tribal when he attacked the very concepts of the season when every single person on the jury had a chance to be in Chris's shoes. Not smart. In fact, one of the common arguments against him was that coming back into the game from so early gave him a big advantage when it came to knowing what people on the jury were looking for, especially since the ideas for the moves that he did coming back into the game came from War Dog and he just executed the strategy. Now, my personal viewpoint, Chris's win does have a major asterisk beside it, and I'm a little disappointed that he didn't get to play again, if only to give a better sample size for how good he was as a player. Because it's not like he sat on his laurels when he got back into the game, although I still agree that he's just not as good as Gavin or Devins. Speaking of which, weren't you on a season where you had a chance to come back into the game after being voted out? And didn't you lose the first duel you're in? In fact, if I were to analyze your strategy for a second, it's always been to align yourself with female contestants that you view as stupid, your words, not mine, and importantly, ones that are typically not great at challenges. And remember what I said about Brett earlier? I was paraphrasing you when talking about needing to beat the last person who wasn't in your alliance in a challenge. And, uh, how long did that take? couple of rounds of the game, right? I mean, maybe it's me, but I would imagine that the hardest thing for you in the game would be the thing that you have the least success in doing. And other than jury management, challenges sound like a good shout on that front. It's not that you're awful at them, but clearly they aren't your strong suit. I think it's a bad concept. I don't think it works. It's a different show. Like Jeff tells me all the time, it's, that's a different show, Russell. There's a flaw in the game. That's a different show. I want the the uh, fans to be able to vote. That's a different show. Well, what the hell is what's happening? It's turning into a different show. The Russell making the entry about himself counter is currently at two. That being said, I actually agree with you somewhat. I don't think the concept is flawed per se, but it makes more sense as, well, a different show. If anything, and I hate to say this, but this being the norm for a show called Survivor makes more sense than Big Brother having a battle back every single season, including one that pauses the game for a whole last week so I can just be disappointed twice when Jared gets eliminated in a way that was really just a foregone conclusion about midway through and you know what? I'm sorry. I'm talking about a different show that had someone who got voted out pre-jury win. Let's get back to Edge of Extinction. My point is that you're right, it's different, but not in the same way as what Jeff told you, which you kindly explained for us. Jeff was making a reference to the original concept of Big Brother and Big Brother's tendency, even after the first season, to have home audience vote on things that happen in the house, including advantages and there even being an entire player at one point that was controlled by the general public. However, in this case, 
the people on the island still have control over who wins the game. In fact, remember me pointing out that Chris had an advantage because of getting to interact with the jury directly? The way it's different is quite literally in the opposite direction of what you want. So comparing this to you getting called out for wanting the audience to decide the winner, it's less apples to oranges and more apples to fish. They aren't even in the same food group. So you have someone that didn't even have to play strategically, comes back in the game and wins. So that gives him a spot for number four overrated player in the history of the game. Except he did have to play strategically when he re-entered the game, and it was his attempt at a strategic maneuver that got him voted out. Kind of like someone else who played in a season with a returning player mechanic, but anyway. Chris convincing someone else to play an idol for him? That's strategic. Picking the right person to hold the other half of his idol so that he could trust them to give it back to activate it? That's strategic. Putting himself into fire making in spite of the fact that he won the final immunity challenge. That's strategic. All of these things were strategic moves and huge ones at that. I'm not even making the argument that he was the best person to win, but just countering the argument that he didn't have to play strategically once he was back in the game. That being said, he also did while on the edge of extinction as well. He may not have had to do as much in terms of tribal councils, but he did have to play the mental game with the other people on the edge of extinction. As an example of how he failed at this was the merge challenge to re-enter the game. When someone could give one of the competitors a disadvantage, they chose Chris. They viewed him as a threat to win the challenge and made it so that they would not want to see him win. Of course, you would have actually had to watch the season to know that aspect of the mental game that Chris played and didn't do as well at as, say, you. Funny, this is the second entry in a row that leaves me with the impression that you didn't actually watch the seasons you're talking about. Number three, Tony. Now, everybody knows his bag of tricks, and everybody knows his spy shack. To me, that's just craziness. Like... You name something, what are we doing, Big Brother now? You see why I bring up how Big Brother having a tendency to have audience voting as a much more prevalent mechanic in the game is relevant, right? And for those who don't know, this is Tony Vlacos who won Survivor Kageyan. He has a couple other things on his Survivor resume, but uh, we'll, we'll cross that bridge. We name it, like uh, naming alliances and stupid stuff like that. We name something that we're doing and all of a sudden it's a big deal. Like, people do that all the time. You know what? You're right. People do that all the time. They do name alliances and even entire concepts all the time. Why does that make Tony a bad player? Tony's not even the first person to do that with alliances either. Philip did it with Stealth RS, which you could be seen as the prototype to Cops R Us. One of the guys on your list gave himself a name. John Cochran did this when he asked Jeff to refer to him by last name. Players like War Dog and Dreams have gone entirely by nicknames during the entirety of their time on Survivor. Oh, and tribes exist. Tribes with names. A lot of times, an alliance will be named after a tribe that consists primarily of members of that tribe. And it's the same reason that cross-tribe alliances are given names, and why Big Brother alliances tend to have names. Assigning an overall name to a group of people enhances the sense of unity within that group. And so named alliances serves to promote loyalty to that alliance. And again, you were in named alliances! You didn't come up with the names, but all three of your alliances were named after your tribe. But let's talk about naming a thing you do on the island because it starts with a basic fundamental understanding of why Tony talked about his bag of tricks. He had multiple idols that expired at the same time and one of them was a super idol. However, he would be vulnerable at the final four. So he used showmanship and deception to make people believe that his super idol was an idol that could be played at the final four instead, thus essentially extending the life of the idol by lying about how it works. If you were Dan Giesling, you might say that he misted them. If you were Russell Hance, though, you might say that he planted a Russell seed. That's another thing about all this. You did this on your own season. The only difference being that you did it to the camera and never let the players see it. And funnily enough, 
If you had broken out some of the wit and snideness of your confessionals in Final Tribal, you might have done better instead of just repeating the words, I played better over and over again, like a broken fucking record. So yeah, a little bit of goofiness actually does help your game because it makes people like you and it makes you look like less of a threat. Not that you would know anything about threat assessment. You telling me that people ain't had spy shacks? No, the smart ones don't tell the cameraman about it to where the cameraman don't film it while it's happening. How do you know they didn't just ask him to recreate it later and then splice the shots together? I mean, you've been on Survivor. I would think that you'd know that happens more than I would. Think about it. There's only been a couple of times he's been shown in a spy shelter and it was visually in the same shot as other people without a cut. And one of those is even debatable, by the way. The smart ones do it without naming it. The smart ones have that bag of tricks and something already in there. Uh, you know, idols found without clues that I play. I don't have to name the bag. You also at, I'm pretty sure no point had multiple idols at the same time. See what I said earlier about the actual purpose of the bag of tricks. It was used as a tactic to keep votes off of him without even needing to play the idol. But damn, yeah, let's talk about playing idols after finding them without clues for a second since you want to go there. I mean, you use the cameraman as your clue, like I said earlier, for one. You can argue that other people who found idols without clues also had that, sure. But the fact remains that considering how often it's been done after you, it's really only a brag because you did it first. It makes more sense to name the bag if you were to have multiple idols at once, which you never did. This makes you more similar to Ben Dryberger. Ben Dryberger! Right. Anyway, you're right, he didn't need to name the bag at all. He just made explosion sounds when he reached into it for a Ben Bomb. But hey, it's no keep hope alive. Now is it? Yeah, just because your theatrics for idols are different doesn't mean that you suddenly don't have them. Oh, yeah, almost forgot. Uh, counter for the number of times Russell's made the entry about himself is at three. I mean, come on, man. Because I can guarantee you... Some things happen out there. For instance, Brandon, when Brandon played, you see Michaela bending down, right? And then you see Brandon's eyes through bushes. Come on, that's editing. Hey, remember when I said that thing about how they could have spliced together clips after asking for something to be reenacted? Or maybe they got footage of him in the spy shack when no one was there and then edited alongside footage of people actually talking. Yeah, Russell, just explain this exact concept, but seems to think that they can use that practice to dramatize his nephew, but not Tony Vlacos, human pixie stick. Come on, guy. You see Tony in his spy shack looking. Really? I mean, how many people do you think tried to spy on people? I think Tony's game was a lot similar to yours truly, and but he won his season because uh, the second place guy that... I don't even name, know his name, the Asian kid, was too dumb enough to know that he had to bring someone else besides Tony. His name was Wu, by the way. God, the Asian kid. It's that kind of cultural awareness that leads to somebody tattooing a Star of David onto their elbow when they aren't even a convert to Judaism, let alone ethnically so. But back to Kageyan. I mean, fair, that's true. Wu did make a mistake bringing Tony over Cass, Although I'd argue that Cass may have been able to beat Wu anyway, but that's not what we're talking about. So let's look at why Tony was a bad choice to bring to Final Tribal. It's because of his charisma and his ability to charm the jury. You may have noticed that during his Final Tribal, when he talked about spying on other people, others were laughing along, and that's because of the way that he framed it. That's the thing. He didn't just say, I played better and leave it at that. He gave details of what he did, and even if those are things that are common and simple, the presentation matters. But there's another factor to this. Why did Wu take Tony over Cass? That's simple. Tony convinced Wu that taking Tony was the better option. He told him it would hurt him with the jury. See, unlike you, Tony actually had plays when his back was against the wall that didn't rely on playing an idol. I could go into detail about how if you were a better player, you could have tried different tactics in order to get out of the situations you were in where you were voted out or how 
You also made even dumber decisions about who to set next to at the final tribal council, but I think my point still stands, even if I don't say those things. And that's the Tony was a major factor in why Wu chose to take him. After all, Wu was originally going to take Cass before Tony got to him. More proof that you didn't actually watch the season. Or the episode where he won. Right? Or Tony wouldn't have won. Now, Tony played recently, looked like a crazy person, running around, uh, hollering like a llama, in the, you know, as soon as he gets on the island. Game changers. This is actually a fair point. Tony didn't do very well on Game Changers. But that being said, it wasn't actually Tony's running around that got him voted out. I mean, if it was, I could point out the fact that you started immediately digging for idols on Heroes vs. Villains and everybody on the island called you out for it, but that's not the case. I mean, to some degree, it, it was because of him running around, but really it was more so going against Sandra when he really should have worked with the majority that he had created with the Big Threats Alliance for the time being. He was impatient in how he played compared to before, and the result was that Sandra had the upper hand over him. But, like, generally what you're saying is correct here, which is why I wouldn't give you as much guff for calling him overrated if you were being more balanced about how you presented it instead of trash-talking people for playing like you. Now... Tony's mo is playing right now in winners that I hear. I don't know if that for sure, but I hear that he is. And uh, that we'll see. We'll see. I think he's overrated. Let's see how good he does in the game. I don't think he's going to do well at all. So that's going to prove my point that it's overrated. It's going to get to a point to where Tony's not even going to be on the list of, of any player that's uh, strategically good at all they're gonna just think his his season was flawed look i don't normally use information the person doesn't know yet as part of my point but when you say your future prediction is part of your evidence i have to call you out and besides it's normally your job to spoil seasons that haven't come out yet anyway so here's the thing he did do well really well in fact so well that he fucking won the season by way of doing a better job than he did in Game Changers of adapting his strategy and not getting as paranoid. I mean, he blindsided Sophie with an idol in her pocket. There's really two situations when you go out with an idol in your pocket, Russell. One of them is a blindside that hits you so hard, there's no way that you can see it coming. And in Sophie's case, Tony was her very close ally there's so there's no way she thought that he was actually going to vote against her because he built that trust with her but he made this move specifically so that sarah would rely on him more of course the other way you get voted out with an idol in your pocket is when you're the target and you're just make a really dumb play that would be really really stupid but you know nobody comes into mind that's done that on day five when he was being called a champion even though he never won it's, it's you by the way you're the person who did that so that's it tony you're number three on my list and number two is rob c not getting it confused with boss and rob a lot of you probably think oh he's got boss and rob in this list why would i do that why would I do that? Just because I don't like him in the game? Uh, I don't mind him personally, but in the game of Survivor, we don't get along. But he's still a solid player. Rob's still a legend. That's depending on what's going to happen. I know he's out playing right now. What happens with him there? What happens if he go home early again? I mean, I don't know. Then we discuss that. I'll be discussing that kind of thing on my, uh, when they do season 40. I'm going to be reopening my podcast and we're going to discuss the entire season. Once a week, I'm going to be doing a show. Now, my more astute viewers may have noticed that absolutely none of what he just said had anything to do with the Rob that he's talking about, Rob Sesternino, who is called the smartest player to have never won by many other people who played with him. But he well, once again, made the entry about himself and promoting his podcast. Now, this probably just sounds to a lot of you like me just adding to the counter and berating him for going off topic. Well, it kind of is, but it's going to be real relevant to the content on his entry on Sesternino. 
believe it or not. So anyway, we have Rob C. Rob C wouldn't even be mentioned as a legend if he wouldn't have done his podcast. This is the other one I was talking about. He wouldn't even be in the conversation if he wouldn't have a podcast. So his podcast is literally putting him into legendary status? Come on. Except he was being called a legend in the DVD commentary of All Stars by the players. You know, before the podcast existed, before the Hidden Immunity Idols existed, six fucking years before his podcast started. Ironically enough, also six fucking years before you played. The irony, of course, being that your second season was the first season he covered in Rob Has a Podcast. And there's actually a major parallel with you as well. See, in All Stars, Rob C. was cited early on as a major strategic threat. It's why he was voted out early. As a matter of fact, he was the first one to be voted out from the Shapara tribe. Now, I want you to consider that for a moment. Someone who had a third place finish, and then when he came back, people had seen him play and scouted him as a threat, thus resulting in him being the first one voted out of his tribe. I mean, sure, you got two final threes, but those were back to back with your second season occurring before the first one aired. When you came back for a season where people did know your strategy though, not only did they vote you out as quick as they could, but they threw in order to get you out, something Rob's tribe didn't do to him. So I guess I also need to add to the counter of people whose reason for being overrated is related to how similar their gameplay is to yours then, huh? Not that this whole entry doesn't read as jealousy that his podcast is respected and yours isn't. I watched his season. I didn't watch his season a while back when I called him a legend. Now I watch this season. He flip-flops. He goes from alliance to alliance. Now that could be called a uh, strategic play. It also could be called very indecisive play to where you don't know what you're doing. So you have to go here. You messed up here. So you better go to this alliance or you messed up in this alliance. It's just a, you're flip-flopping like a fish. You know, when you say that you watched his season... I think a lot of people are expecting me to go, I don't believe you, and then list all of these like massive amounts of reasons why I don't believe you in this instance. But you know what? I actually do. His lack of loyalty, either perceived or actual lack of loyalty, is what prevented him from reaching final tribal council in both instances. I don't necessarily agree with it, though, since there have been plenty of winners that do play like that. This is one where I can say it's a difference of opinion rather than you just talking out of your ass. I would argue that it was better for him to play that way for the situation he was in during the Amazon, but may have gotten further being more loyal to someone like Boston Rob in All Stars. And it's just a different type of strategy than the way that you played previously. It doesn't mesh with you as well. I, I totally get it. Because you generally did stick to your guns on who you were on side with, which actually makes you pretty different from a Tony or a Sester Nino or, hell, one of my favorite players, Cochran. So, in spite of me not agreeing with you, I actually do get why Rob is here. As a matter of fact, you're kind of going to basically just go on this same point for the next 20 seconds. Nothing wrong with that, but I think we can just skip straight to the number one segment. Yeah. And the moment you've all been waiting for. <laughs> number one. Number one overrated player in the history of the game is Sandra Diaz Twine. Okay, now you done put me in a very awkward position because the credit that I just gave you, I have to wash that away now. You really out here putting the woman who beat your ass in Heroes vs. Villains as the most overrated survivor player of all time. Okay. Hold on, hold on. To be fair, if this wasn't coming from your salty ass crack and you hadn't been stroking your own goddamn ego throughout the whole video, I could actually see a real argument for Sandra being at the very least somewhat overrated. Her strategy of just making sure the person the target is on isn't her is very effective. But with her threat level as high as it tends to be after her first two wins, she has to take a different approach in later seasons which results in her having much more of a target on her. To be fair though, she's pretty damn good at putting the target away from her to the point where both of the times in US Survivor that she's been voted out, it had to be a blindside. And 
This is still with her immunity game being one of the weakest of any contestant to even make the merge on Survivor, let alone who won. Granted, she's still one of the greatest Survivor players, but holes in her game do point towards the idea that, well, maybe she's in the top 10 rather than being a candidate for number one. So in that sense, sure, someone could call her overrated and it would be a valid entry, especially as the most overrated. But based on the tone of the rest of this list, that's not the kind of thing that you're going to say. She won twice, right? The reason I played with her, okay? I played with her. I know. I know how she plays. I know how it feels. I know what she does. Uh, she gives up easy. One time Jeff had a thing. We was holding our arms in the air. It's the challenge poverty one. And Jeff comes out and says, who here would quit for $50,000 and two movie tickets. She raises her hand. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Which challenge that Parvati won? She won three different ones on your season. Okay, to be fair, you did specify that it was the one where you guys had your arms over your heads. Which challenge that Parvati won where you had your arms over your heads? She won two of those. How do you manage to continue vague posting while still giving more details? Now, I did do my homework and went back to watch these and see if what you said was actually shown. As without this, it just sounds like lying out of your ass and you would never do that. But I did notice something very interesting. The first of these challenges, it's an endurance challenge where you guys had your arms, one arm above your head. Not both arms, but I'm not, but you didn't really specify, so this could be it. Especially since throughout the challenge, Jeff was giving these temptations for people to step down from the challenge. And well, Sandra agreed to take the first temptation before Jeff even revealed it. Now, this being relevant will come up later, but here's the big thing about that. So did you right after her. So she's a quitter and you're not then. And see, if you really embellish it right, it, Sounds pretty damn close to what Russell was talking about. I mean, the thing about 50K and the two movie tickets, it seems like something that could get brought up as to what the temptation could be in this challenge. Considering how much Jeff, especially around this time, hates people who quit the game, I don't think he would seriously be offering people a chance to quit the actual game of Survivor, but rather drop out of a challenge which is the exact point of this challenge in particular. And if he thought that she was a quitter, he damn sure wouldn't want to cast her in Game Changers. Now, it's possible that this was said and just didn't make it on the show. Sure. But it seems really weird that you were so vague about which challenges was. There's a specific challenge that fits the criteria where someone is offered food to quit a challenge and not the game... I did not think you twisted the comments to mean something that they don't. Which is relevant to how you're going to be using the quitting point, by the way. Now, they're playing uh, Edge of Extinction right now. She's the type of player that would walk off. If she gets voted out, and on Edge of Extinction, you get a choice, right? She's the type of player, and we talked about this. That's why I'm bringing it up. We talked about this on Johnny's uh, pod, Fair Place podcast. She's the type of person that would leave. She would quit. You can call it quitting or you can call it giving up. It's like some people are like, oh, it may not be quitting. I don't know if she does that. I don't know if that happens. But it would happen with someone with her style, her personality. She gives up easily. Okay, so first of all, I kind of need to rebuttal this point on the basis of how it applies to Sandra. And to do so, I actually do need to use information that he doesn't know here. Although he is correct that Sandra did opt out of the Edge of Extinction. In later interviews, though, Sandra would clarify that she only did so knowing her chances of coming back from the Edge were next to none. She was voted out. She was fine with that being the end result. She would have stayed on the Edge, though, if she had known that leaving the Edge meant leaving the jury because she wanted to be on the jury, which is one of the few things that she had never done on Survivor. The point of what I say here is that what you call quitting and giving up is someone knowing their weaknesses and not playing into those weaknesses. 
If Sandra has to rely on a challenge to come back into the game, she knows she's not going to succeed at that. This is why she's quick to sit out of tribe challenges. She knows that's not what her game is about. So she focuses on the aspects of her game that she is stronger in, which is primarily the social play. The fact that she is this weak in these areas could be a reason to call her overrated. But that's not what you mean. And the next part of my point is why I say that. So she's overrated because she wouldn't come back into the game from the edge. And yet Chris is overrated because he came back into the game from the edge. I mean, you even said it was an entirely different show. So she's overrated at Survivor because she's less effective in what you describe as a different game from Survivor? Now, there are people in that game that quits the game, and there's people that, uh, that, that quits physically and walks out the door, and people that quits mentally. She quits mentally when she plays. She just wants to, I don't want to do anything strategic. I just want to do whatever anybody else wants. I'll just do that. Follow along. That is the strategic maneuver, and it provided the name for the exact strategy she was using, which was coined by her. Anyone but me. She basically just follows along with what the louder voices are wanting to do so that she can continue to move further in the game without having to rely on challenge strength because she's better at getting people to feel like she's on their side. The problem with this strategy is that once you see that someone is playing like that, it's much easier to get people on board with voting them out because no one has a reason to keep them other than as a number. And like it or not, it's a perfectly valid and winning strategy to get other people to make moves that benefit you. Sophie did it with Coach, Sandra did it with you, the Black Widow Brigade did it with Eric, and hell, to a certain extent, you did it with Shambo and Samoa. And then she got lucky and won twice in a row. It's crazy. I mean, luck is always going to be involved when it comes to winning a game like this, but it wasn't as simple as luck. She put herself in a position where she looked like she wasn't threatening and then revealed her strategy at Final Tribal Council so that it was the last thing the jury was thinking about before they voted. JT pulled this in Token Teens as well, and he played the first perfect game doing it. And no, it's not luck just because you made a bad read on who the jury was going to vote for. Twice. I brought it to the end of Heroes vs. Villains because she was such a bad player I was like, there's no way. There's no way. Now, my decision bringing poverty, uh, she was the only one left, her and Jerry. I knew Jerry would win. So I had to choose poverty. <coughs> so I bring Sandra in poverty, right? She beats me. We're just going to gloss over the fact that poverty also got more votes than you. Everyone from the Heroes Tribe that was in that jury, which was the majority of the jury, by the way, voted for Sandra. So what the fuck does that tell you about how in-fucking-correct you were about that read? Hell, I'd argue that you were fucked the second that you handed the idol the Heroes gave you to Parvati. But we'll touch on that in a moment. Because of, in my opinion, because of a bit of jury. It's not because of a strategic play. Her strategic play was to get rid of Russell Hans the entire game. Did that work out for her? No. I mean, it kind of did. It won her a million dollars. I mean, for one, when you really look at it, the only time she voted against you was in the pre-merge. After that, it was mostly lip service and presenting herself as the anti-Russell option, backing down when it wasn't going to work. And that's the thing. The strategy wasn't just about who she tried to eliminate. It was also about how she maneuvered when other people weren't willing to vote the way she wanted them to. And it's also in presenting herself to the jury as the choice that was against Russell. You, however, got caught not knowing about idols twice, once by each of the people you took to the final three. Now, think about that for a second, Idol Man. They were able to withhold information from you and to live through it. You should have been flipping over to the Heroes Tribe the second Parvati pulled out a second idol you didn't know about because she just proved what they were trying to tell you correct. And she played those idols on Jerry and Sandra. That should tell you who Parvati was really loyal to way before you flipped on Danielle. 
you also should have been paying attention to the way the jury was reacting to Sandra playing her idol at Final Six. They were eating it up, and that should have told you that Sandra wasn't as much of a long shot as you thought. You can cry bitter jury all you want, but if you go out there and you pin the blame for people getting voted out on someone else while secretly directing things without people realizing it, that wins championships on Survivor. Her physical play, how'd that work out for her? I said she couldn't even uh, walk without talk, talk and walk at the same time. She falls on her face. She, uh, she may be one of the worst physical players to ever play the game. Kind of countering my own argument here, but her physical game being weak can actually be seen as an asset considering the precise way that she plays. She's trying to keep her threat level low, so her physical game being weak means that she's looked at as less of a threat, which is admittedly something that's more valuable going into the merge than in pre-merge gameplay. Thus why most of the time she'll either get booted pre-merge or make it all the way to the end. In her social game, she says her, herself, she's sassy Sandra. So she's sassy to everybody. That's her social game. Which can be appealing, especially if you're honest about it. I'm pretty sure you've heard the phrase, better the devil you know than the devil you don't. It's easier to trust someone who will call you names to your face than someone who does it behind your back, because at least you know where they stand. For fuck's sake, Courtney was on Heroes vs. Villains after being sassy to everyone, and she was on the Heroes Tribe. Gee, I wonder. That's the three aspects that you have to vote for. She's bad in all of them. She is by far the number one worst player to win the game. So it make, gives her a spot at my number one spot here. She likes to win things. She won this one. I mean, most people like to win. The, I'm sorry. No, you said she's the worst person to win when you called out someone earlier for winning the game by literally not playing the part that you think matters. That statement right there is proof that this entire video and your entire persona for that matter is just salt over the fact that you didn't win when you thought you should have. But you know what? This is just classic Russell. This is a man who threatened to sue his tribe for throwing an immunity challenge to vote his stank ass out. This man is just so quick to call his own shortcomings, and I do mean short, as the fault of other people and not his own failings at the basic concept of being a decent human being. Look, the fact of the matter is this. Your jury wasn't fucking bitter. And even if they were, they're allowed to be bitter. You honestly think that berating women on an island is good social play? Yeah, almost as good as allegedly beating them when you get back, huh? Now, before anybody criticizes me, I know. That's an extreme interpretation of what actually happened. And the woman he supposedly shoved did apparently ask for the charges to be dropped. But what would the history of your family getting ejected from reality shows for both threats of physical assault and actual physical assault? I legitimately would not be surprised if your transphobic ass just dangled an immunity idol in front of the DA to get yourself out of it. Yeah, long story short, my advice is that people shouldn't take deranged garden gnomes named Russell Hant seriously when it comes to survivor opinions, or life opinions for that matter, because it's going to be filled with so much salt over the fact that he didn't win that his blood pressure is in fucking Saturn. Piss grapes and get fucked, which I'm guessing that divorce of yours really interfered with. Uh, wow, holy shit. Okay, so now that the commentary's over, I'm guessing you're done fixing shit, right? Do you mind if I ask you something before you dip again? <sighs> yes. Yes, I do mind. I mind very immensely, but you know what? Fuck it. Go ahead. Why did you stop me from giving my final thoughts on Ephraim in my commentary on him? 